Good morning. Welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday in Lent. Welcome to Schenkel United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And this morning I want to point out, for those of you who perhaps are not as familiar with Schenkel United Church of Christ, that we say those words, that you are welcome, because this congregation has done the work to intentionally become an open and affirming congregation. And in light of the recent statement by Pope Francis, I want to say that we do not agree with his statement. Love is love. No matter who you love and whoever you are, you are loved because God is love and no one is an abomination to God who is love. And you are welcome here always at Schenkel United Church of Christ. As we begin our time of worship this morning, I would just like to remind you that our services for Palm Sunday, for Monday Thursday, for Good Friday, will all be recorded and will be available in the same way that you are accessing this service, through our YouTube channel or through our website. And then on Easter Sunday, we will be gathering in person for two separate services that will be identical in their content, one at 8.30 on Easter Sunday and one at 10.30. And we invite you to call the church office and to reserve a place for yourself at one of those services so we can make sure that we are doing everything we can to keep everyone safe, to be socially distanced and to wear our masks and to continue to be as careful as we can while still gathering in the same place for a change to celebrate the resurrection. So this morning, as we begin our worship, please join me in a spirit of prayer. Loving and holy God, we give thanks for this opportunity to once again come together in your presence even as we do this virtually and as we look forward to the day when we can once again gather together in one another's presence as well as in your presence. We continue to try to be careful even in the weariness that we feel from the pandemic, from the isolation, from wearing masks, all of those things. We we offer all of those feelings and the anxieties that we feel, we offer them to you, gracious God, and ask that in this time of worship, your presence would be felt by each one of us. We would be aware that we are, are together in spirit and that we come to worship you, to offer you our praise and to ask for your spirit to strengthen our faith and to encourage us in our faith journey for another week. We give you thanks and pray that our worship may be in spirit and in truth. Amen. My Lenten discipline in recent years has been to give up some of the music that I might listen to when I'm riding in the car or cooking um, and choose a deeper theological musical work that I can really immerse myself in during the season of Lent. So that might mean putting away the things that are on my normal playlist, Dave Brubeck, Susan Werner, Miles Davis, um, Maroon 5, Hamilton and choosing something that I might not normally be listening to. I've listened to Foray's Requiem and um, Verdi's Requiem, uh, Brahms, uh, St. John's 
Passion by Bach and my favorite which is St. Matthew's Passion by Bach. And I have it playing in the background right now. You actually know part of this. I'll stop for a moment and you can listen. Do you recognize the tune, O Sacred Head Now Wounded? It is part of St. Matthew's Passion. So uh, Bach read the book of Matthew, um, specifically the, well, I'm sure he read it all, but specifically the story of Jesus' passion, and he set it to music. So this is his interpretation of Matthew's interpretation of the Passion Week of Jesus. And he tells the whole story. Uh, it's in German, so the liner notes are helpful to me in knowing exactly what's happening. Um, but it's very deep. Uh, Bach was the preeminent composer of the Baroque period from 1600 to 1750. And uh, he was a busy guy. He was writing music every week for his choirs and for him to play on the organ at the church where he served in Germany. And uh, he, had, he was really cranking things out. St. Matthew's Passion um, was originally uh, performed in the early 1800s early 1700s, sorry, and um, he did a lot of really unique things in it. Uh, one of the things that I found fascinating to read about was the theological and numerical significance that he built into the composition. For example, there's a certain bass note that happens 30 times because it is referring to the 30 pieces of silver that Judas received for selling Jesus out. There is another phrase uh, that is sung 11 times, once for each of the disciples except for Judas. And my favorite tidbit of all is that tune, the chorale, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Here it comes again. Each time, I think it shows up five times in the overall work, and each time it comes along, it is a half step lower than the time before. Bach was illustrating the descent to Jesus' death. I think that's a pretty, a pretty interesting uh, little facet of his thinking as he was putting this music together. Interestingly enough, Bach died in 1750 and his music was almost lost to the ages. In 1829, Mendelssohn revived it, and actually I think it was Mendelssohn's grandmother who said, you should check this out, and he did. It was performed again in 1829, about 100 years after it originally was performed. And ever since then, it's been beloved. So I appreciate Mendelssohn, and we certainly appreciate Bach and all that he has given to um, the church. Let us draw near to God as we confess our sin and ask forgiveness. Eternal God, you love us steadfastly. 
but we have trouble loving you in return. You call us, but we have wax-filled ears. You reveal yourself, but our eyelids are heavy. You lead us toward our neighbor, but we build walls around ourselves. You hate evil, injustice, and alienation, but we get used to it. O oh God, we pray, help us to see ourselves both as we are and as we might be before you, and draw us by your Spirit's tether into your forgiving, renewing, and serviceable grace through the mercies of Christ. Amen. God says to us, You are my chosen ones. I love you. I'm proud of you. Stand firm in your renewed commitment. Know that I have forgiven you. I call you by name. You are mine. I have entered into covenant with you and will stand by you in all times and all places. Dare to live fully the life to which I have called you. Amen. Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31. 
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And our gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Now among those who went up to worship at the fellowship festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single, seed, single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. So we have in this passage from John, we begin with Greeks who come and approach one of Jesus' disciples and say, we wish to see Jesus. John never gets around to telling us whether they ever did get to see Jesus or not. Because in telling his story, John uses this request as an opportunity for another discourse by Jesus to talk about what it means to follow him. Jesus sets it out in rather stark terms. He talks about embracing death, hating one's life to gain eternal life, and about following specifically through death to life, taking up a cross. And we know from 
some of our gardening experiences perhaps about how a seed must die before it can sprout and grow, right? So Jesus talks about embracing death, not being afraid of it, that death precedes life. Do you remember when you were a kid in school? It's usually in like first or second grade, I think, that we would have a um, glass mason jar and then we put paper around the edge and then you put beans down in there and you, and you made sure the paper was wet. And then you got to see the sprouts come. So what you put in was this dried up bean. But then what came from it, once the, the bean died, then the little sprouts started up and then the little roots start down and it doesn't look anything like what you planted. The same thing Jesus is saying here, a grain of wheat, if all you have is, is a grain of wheat, but if you plant it and it dies and the sprout comes up and the roots go down, then you get a whole stalk and you produce, it produces much fruit. That's one of the mysteries of death and life and what God can do with death, transforming it into new life. And then he says that those who hate their life, those who love their life will lose it, but those who hate their life will find it and will gain eternal life. And in, in this part, actually, it comes into play, this part where he says, now is the judgment of this world, this cosmos, not, not the world like the earth as a planet, but the cosmos, the, perhaps a better interpretation for our understanding would be the system, the system in which we live is going to be judged now. And, and Jesus said, now at his time will be judged and the ruler of this cosmos, this system will be driven out. And when I think of the system, the systems that, that we live with, the systems that operate under a force or a spirit of domination, of violence, of death. That's the system in which we live. And Jesus is judging it. It's time for a decision. Are we going to keep going with the system, or are we going to pursue eternal life, which is life lived in the presence of God? And only when we begin to see the system for what it is, which takes some work and some growth, often takes us years of living under the system, to suddenly, sometimes it's called, it feels like an awakening. Like suddenly we're awakened to see, oh, that's just, somebody wants power and that's how, how the system works on, on domination and on violence and death, but death for some people, death for the people who are not in power, oppression for those who are not in the dominant positions when we can finally see the system for what it is, then we are free to live outside of the system and live life fully according to how Jesus lived his life outside of the system, outside of that imperial system in, to which he was born. He was free to live and to love and to heal and to seek people's the good of all those that he encountered. Then to people who are still within the system, it will look to them like we hate our life because we choose another way. And the way we choose as followers of Jesus is eternal life, life lived in the presence of God and it will look like we hate our life. 
but we are actually loving it and learning a different way that is outside of the system into which we have all been born. The third thing that Jesus talks about is about following him specifically all the way to his death and beyond. And that is difficult. This journey that we take every year during Lent, we know that it ends in Good Friday. We know where Jesus is headed. And yet we are invited every year to, to take this journey, to be reminded of the way he lived his life and how he offered his life and did not reject what the system was doing to him because he believed God had more life for him. And even as it is difficult for us to do that, and we are called, especially during, during Holy Week, to, to walk, to not turn away, to not go from the joy of Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry immediately to Easter Sunday, but to remember that in between, there is great suffering, there is betrayal, there is arrest, there is a kangaroo court, there is a condemnation, and there is a crucifixion. And as difficult as that is for us to, year after year at least, to be made aware of it during Holy Week, it is important for us to witness that, to not be afraid to look away, because we are called to remember we are called even during the season of Lent to remember what that means and what Jesus did for us. And it helps us as well. In our times of suffering, it's so easy for us to ask, where is God? In this time of pandemic that we have lived through and, and the trauma, the fear, and now, perhaps, the fear of gathering again. These fears are real. We have been through a lot in this last year. And perhaps you have asked, where is God? More than 500,000 people have died just of this one disease, just in our nation. Where is God? God is right here in the midst. The Greeks asked to see Jesus. They perhaps didn't know what they were asking or what they might see. But when we come looking for Jesus and asking where God is, we find God in the garden we find God receiving the kiss of a friend in betrayal. We find God arrested, brought before a court, condemned, carrying a cross, nailed on a cross, dying. When we ask to see Jesus, that is where we see him, lifted up, and in that lifting up, drawing all people to himself. God is always right in the center of our suffering. The true glory of God is God's willingness to share fully in what it means to be human, to suffer. And the glory of God is also the symbol of God's willingness to transform what it means to be human.
to be present with us in all suffering because we know that Jesus went to death and beyond. And whenever we come to death, we know that he is with us and will carry us beyond to the more life that God is always offering to us. Eternal life. Life lived in the presence of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to join me in an attitude of prayer as we lift up our requests and our joys in our prayers of intercession. We give thanks, loving God, for the opportunity to come to you in prayer. And today we lift up the many people who are doing the hard work of grieving. We pray for Carly and her family and the loss of her mom. We lift up Forrest and Mary Lou and Carolyn, who have all lost their spouses in the last few months, and ask for your grace and your comfort. We lift up before you our members for this week, for Barb, for Joan and Joe, Ron, Sue and Gary, and Gary, and ask for your grace, for your mercy for each one, that this week you would encourage their faith, that they would be aware of your presence walking with them. We continue to pray, God, for all who live with the challenges of mental illness. We remember Sam and Elizabeth, and all others who live with these challenges and for their families, for spouses and parents and siblings who walk with them. We pray that each one would be able to access the health care that they need, to be able to connect with therapists who can help them, and that you would bless them and encourage them on their journey and grant them good health and strength each day. We give thanks, God, that Deb and Galen have made good progress in their therapy and have been released from going to therapy all the time. We pray you that they would continue to gain strength and, and good health. 
And we continue to pray for Barb as she sees incremental progress. You would encourage her heart each day with renewed strength. For Barbara and her recovery from her surgery, for Dawn and recovery from her broken foot, for Rosemary, for Cole and for his parents and his siblings, we ask for health and healing, for Lily and for Bill Sr. We ask that you would give each one renewed strength, courage to face the challenges that they're facing in, in regards to their health and we ask for your hand of healing and wholeness for each one. And God, for all of those requests that are unspoken and known only to you, we ask that your grace would be proven abundant for each one, that you would grant wisdom and decisions that need to be made, courage for the days ahead, and for each one of us in our own ways that we have encountered and confronted the pandemic and all that has involved, may we each have the courage for more transitions ahead. And we ask for your blessings of being able to find places for vaccinations, being able to make appointments and get to them and that soon we would be able to worship together once again. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank you once again for your faithfulness in supporting Schenkel United Church of Christ and also for sending in your offerings for one great hour of sharing. When we began our worship time this morning, you perhaps noticed behind me the poster, Let Love Flow, which is the theme for our one great hour of sharing offering. And right now I just want to share some things from the materials that they give to us for a mission moment and this is how our One Great Hour of Sharing helps not only people in other countries, but also um, UCC churches in the United States and the, the congregations and the places um, out west. And this one, this article is about the forest fires out west. And from January 1st to November 30th last year, 2020, there were 2,000 577 more forest fires than there had been the year before. So it had been of 2020, not only with the pandemic, but an increase in the extremely dry conditions and the, for, the number of forest fires. And those forest fires in California, especially, burned twice as much acreage as they had in the last year. So August and September and October were three months that were very devastating for places in Oregon and California, Northern California. At one point, California was burning from the Northern part all the way down to the Mexican border, which is a, a space of 800 miles. Just, it's really hard for us on the East Coast with so much rain and it's so green, it's hard to imagine the devastation. But in response to all the fires, in the midst of the pandemic, the United Church of Christ 
was barely able to provide any support to the conferences and the communities impacted. Of course, the church and its leaders prayed, asked others to pray, and we also kept checking in to let our colleagues know of our care. In Oregon, and I thought of this especially because we had Jen Yoakum was here for a few weeks in, I believe it was in September, because she lives in Oregon, and they had to leave for health reasons because of the smoke, and they came out here to be with their family for a little while. In Oregon, UCC Disaster Ministries walked with leaders in the conference as they began their response and learned to work in the community. Our team introduced them to key people in the disaster field who could help the Central Pacific Conference who had not experienced this level of disaster in recent history. So with a newly formed disaster recovery team, the conference was engaged in support to all of its congregations on a regular basis. With 17 UCC churches directly impacted, support was provided for members, community organizations that assist the migrant and homeless population, and many who were displaced, and several families lost everything in their homes. With so much loss in Oregon, the UCC provided an initial grant of $20,000 and is gearing up for long-term recovery process when the time is right. So continued gifts to the West Coast wildfires are appreciated. And this is part of what our money from One Great Hour of Sharing offering goes to, to help people also in our own country, not just in um, Vietnam, as we, we heard about last year, last week. But um, that, that offering goes to help in many, many places. And so we appreciate your giving generously to our one great hour of sharing. And now as we move into another week, may you go forth empowered, encouraged by those Greeks who came to see Jesus, knowing that the Jesus we see may not be what we were expecting, but the Jesus we see is the one we need and the one who walks with us through every valley and every mountaintop. Go in the peace of Christ. Stay.